Hello, my name is Kevin Edwards. I'm at Illinois State University and I manage our confocal microscopy core facility. And so today I'd like to take a little time and walk you through the facility, what the layout is and what some of the capabilities are. So this is intended for regional scientists who might be interested in using our facility. And if so, uh, please check out the specifications here at our website and please email me right here uh, for more information. So this is intended for people who have some familiarity with confocal. Uh, and if you don't, I would just uh, point you to more basic sources such as iBio seminars. And they have a very good set of microscopy videos to get you up to speed. Uh, and then you can check out some of the uh, more advanced functions that we have here. All right, so our facility was obtained in 2019 with a grant from the National Science Foundation. I'll just step you through the layout here. So it's a Leica SP8 with a white light laser. This is the white light laser right here. We have an uh, inverted microscope. And so you can put uh, thicker samples, for example, a dish or a 96 wall plate, as well as a microscope slide over here. We can pretty much image anything that is sitting on a number one and a half cover slip. And then it can be any height after that. So it could be sectioned or it could be a whole piece of tissue, for example and then the objectives are coming from below. Here we have a cooled color camera. This allows, us, allows you to um, photograph the fluorescence of your sample in its natural colors in a non-confocal way with uh, an epifluorescence mode. And this is the light emitting diode light source for epifluorescence. That's what you see glowing here. This is not the laser, this is the LED light source. And over here we have the confocal software and we have two screens so you can run the software and collect the image here and have other uh, advanced software such as the 3D imaging going on the other screen. I'll say a little bit about the room. So the room is big enough to have somewhat of a crowd. You can get uh, 10 or 12 people in there all with a uh, ability to view the scope. So it's good for outreach. Now of course that situation would be now, post COVID, whenever that is, uh, during COVID, we try to keep it to about two people uh, in the room at a time. All right, so what I wanna do today is to walk you through the setup of the system. And I wanna take you through three different tools or applications uh, that we have that are not common and not found on every SP8. And so you might find a use for them in your research. And so these are three sort of modes of imaging that let you get a bit more information out of your sample. And then I'll say a little bit about zoom at the end. Now I won't have time to go through the details of all the uh, applications here. So if you wanna know more, please email me. I'd be happy to zoom in and go over these in more depth or any of the things I can't talk about today. All right, so we're going to be talking about fluorescence here. So just as a reminder, if you're not so familiar, fluorescence is a uh, property of certain molecules, often those that have large ring systems. And these act as antennas that can pick up photons. They can absorb a photon that will send them into a higher energy state, into an excited state. Then they'll dissipate a little bit of that energy and then drop down back to the ground state with e often with emission of a photon. So one photon at higher energy comes in, photon at lower energy goes out because you've lost a bit of energy here in the process. So what that means is you'll have a shorter wavelength photon coming in, a longer wavelength photon leaving. So for example, for GFP, you would have a blue photon that would excite it and then it would give off a green photon. Now this process is not instantaneous, it takes a bit of time. And so for example, for GFP, it takes on the order of about three nanoseconds for this to occur. So it's very fast, but it's not instantaneous and the scope can actually measure those lifetimes and use that as a different imaging mode, which we'll talk about. Now, if we just step back here, the scanner is off to the side right here and I'll show you what that looks like. So this is a cutaway of the scanner. I've tried to Photoshop this to make it more customized to our system, uh, but there are 
could be uh, errors in there because I don't know exactly how the hookups, for example, go with the lasers. All right, so what we have here is a bank of four different lasers, which I'll show you in a minute. They're controlled uh, by Custo Optical Tunable Filter AOTF to deliver the correct or desired laser lines to the system. The laser lines then come in here, go through the scanner and to the objective and then to the sample. The fluorescence uh, is picked up by the objective and goes back through the same path through the scanner. And then it passes through a pinhole, which excludes the out of focus light. And then that gets bounced to a prism, which disperses the uh, fluorescence emissions. And then they're bounced to a, an array of detectors, which I'll uh, walk you through in a minute. This graphic is up on our website, uh, which is right here, illinoisstate.edu slash confocal. Uh, so you can inspect that at your leisure and also see the full specifications of the scope at that site. I want to say a little bit about the objectives. Uh, we have a nice array of objectives from 5x to 100x. For the key ones uh, for a typical use would be the 20x water. This is a very bright lens. It gives you a very, very wide field of view, good for scanning across a larger sample. Then we have 40 or 63 water, uh, um, oil, uh, and we also have 40 water, and the 40 water immersion is very good for live imaging. It has a motorized correction collar that you operate through the software. We also have a 63X uh, glycerol lens, and you'll notice this is a, a not as good in terms of numerical aperture as our best lens, but on the other hand, it's better attuned to glycerol. And so if you're mounting in a glycerol based medium, this can theoretically see deeper into the sample. And that might be an advantage depending on if you have a thicker sample. All right, so now I'll talk about the laser lines. And so we have several fixed lines. We have an argon laser, which gives off these three lines. That's the sort of the traditional laser for uh, a confocal. We have two in the violet range. So we have a 405 and a 440. And the 405 in particular would be used for DAPI most typically, but on any other uh, UV types of dyes. And then for the um, blue to red range, we have the white light laser. So the white light laser gives off uh, all um, wavelengths from 470 to 670. And then you use the AOTF to select certain lines and you can select any eight lines at a time. And these are just pictures just snap with the iPhone at the objective as the white light laser moves through its um, range so it goes from blue to red. And you can select uh, any single line among these 200 possible lines. So this is very nice because it allows you to tune your excitation to the exact properties of the particular dyes in your sample or move them to avoid other dyes that you don't want to excite. Now on the um, emission side. So once you've lit up your sample with that white light laser, sample fluoresces, and that fluorescence emission is uh, passed through a prism. Prism disperses that light, and now you've got a rainbow. The, now, your, if your emission is only one wavelength, it may be biased towards red or green or whatever it is, but it, all, all the emissions that are present there are spread out. And then you can use mirrored gates in front of each detector to select exactly which wavelengths you want to send to that detector. Okay. So now you can zoom in not only on the excitation maximum, but also the emission maximum for any given die. We have five detectors of which three are called hybrid detectors or high Ds. And these are very sensitive and very low noise detectors. The other two are, are more traditional photomultiplier tubes. Uh, so this is an example uh, from what we did uh, this month uh, with our collaborators. Uh, so Kylie Hughes from the Vidal Gadea lab 
brought by some rainbow worms. So these are C. elegans with uh, different combinations of five different uh, fluorescent proteins expressed differentially uh, across the nervous system. And so this was just our first sort of quick and dirty experiment of taking live worms. There's a little bit of movement here. As these worms were uh, still a bit active. Uh, and we were able to do 3D um, imaging of the worm with uh, the detectors set, the lasers and detectors set in such a way as to optimize for each of those five different uh, fluorescent proteins so that you can then get different ratios of different of, different of those fluorescent proteins in each neuron and then they're, they uh, end up being differentially colored so you can track individual neurons. Uh, so this is a good example of why the um, multi-detector system and why the white light laser uh, work together very well. All right. So now I'm gonna I'm not gonna say too much more about multicolor imaging. I'll just mention it briefly. What I want to take you through are a couple of different imaging modes, uh, and these arise from some synergy between some of the different components that are present on the scope. So you have to sort of reach a critical mass of different add-on technologies in order to get these applications. And so that's what I wanted to kind of stress with this figure here. So again, we have the white light laser lighting up our sample. We're collecting certain range of emissions from the sample and sending that to our hybrid detector. So I highlighted here a couple of ways that these things work together. So first of all, the white light laser is tunable and the detector array uh, is tunable in terms of what emissions go to the detector. And that combination allows us to do spectral fingerprinting, which I'll talk about next. The hybrid detector is a very fast system and very low noise, and that enables photon counting, which I won't say much about today, but this allows you to quantify things that were otherwise mostly limited to qualitative um, information. But the fact that the hybrid detector is very fast and couple that with the fact that the white light laser is a pulsed laser and that allows you to collect timing information. So above and beyond the spectral information, you also have information on how fast the photons are coming off of the dye. So we'll talk about that a little bit later, but that enables uh, FLIM or fluorescence lifetime imaging. All right, so let me uh, give a brief overview of the software, what it looks like. So over here we have this upper rainbow. This is where our laser lines are set up. You can see the individual laser lines chosen here. The lower rainbow, this is what happens after the prism. So this is the emission light that's spread out by the prism. And these are the detector gates uh, that you saw back here. And they're controlled just manually by sliding them left or right to pick up certain uh, wavelength ranges. And you can set those to the peak of whatever die you're looking at. These are all the scanner controls and 3D controls. And then over here you have the display you see each individual channel. In this case, we're collecting five different channels, four fluorescence and one, the light that passes through the transmitted light. Uh, and that uh, gives you a nice uh, four color image with the DIC like image. We can scan across an entire cover slip. So this icon indicates roughly the dimensions of the cover slip. And so we can scan the whole cover slip uh, relatively quickly, just a few minutes using the navigator function. And that lets us pick out which, uh, for example, in our case, which of these fly heads are the right uh, genotype, which of these larval um, brain and disc and gland complexes are the correct ones. And then we can zoom in and take our good image of, again, three, four, five color fluorescence. 